Now, this is a training course, and I don't want to burden you with a bunch of facts and figures, but it helps in order to understand where we are and where we need to go to know where we came from. The way in which we manage our businesses today, we probably think have been around forever, but the truth is they're really quite recent in human history. If we were to take a timeline, there's a lot of disagreement as to when civilization started, so we'll split the difference depending on how you define civilization and say 5500 BC. And we trace that all the way up to our era, which is, as I write this, it's 2011, we find that what we know of as management and actually even as businesses really starts with the Industrial Revolution, which takes place only about here. It's a very small part overall of human history. The agreed upon beginning of, of the Industrial Revolution was in 1763 and lasted till about 1850. And this brought about radical changes. The most consequential was the movement of capital as money moved from the aristocracy out of their hands and into the hands of the new, we'll call them the business class, what the French called the bourgeoisie. And this led to, as often happens in power struggles, this led to a period of warfare. This forced a complete reorganization of the way armies were maintained. In the past, they had been made up of the aristocracy, then the peasants, and the peasants are the ones who went out and died in the front lines while the aristocracy sat in tents and decided why the wars would take place. We saw a, uh, the creation of a new form of organizational method based on command and control. And as time went on, the armies that were most organized and had the best command and control system were the ones that would win. Along with these changes came an essential decline in the way business had done, been done up until the early 1700s in Europe and the uh, early 1800s in the United States. Before that, tradesmen owned their own businesses and worked them themselves and they made a product one at a time and they sold it to their neighbors. So when James Watt built the first reliable steam engine and ignited the Industrial Revolution, the availability of cheap or fairly cheap reliable energy allowed the concentration of work and instead of just being a tradesman making it himself, he started having people working with him and one workshop could make the wheels for maybe 30 of the outlying communities. And that led to the decline of the cottage industries heading into about 1840. When you had the discovery of coal, and um, that then enabled even larger, even more complicated uh, organizational structures that would lead to mass production, uh, allowing now at this point not just the neighboring communities um, to be supplied by one factory, but now it was possible for one factory, for instance, a factory in England could produce enough of a fabric in order to supply all of the colonies. Of the States. Um, so this created a new challenge, which is the challenge of distribution, which you saw as the rise of the railroads. With the rise of the railroads, there came, of course, new and unexpected problems, as always happens when you have a new technology. And for this, I'll refer to the highly recommended book, The Leader's Handbook, by Peter Schultz. October 5th, 1841, two railroad trains collided on its trip between, what was it, between Worcester, Mass., which was a big industrial trade center at that time, and Albany, New York. A conductor and a pastor died, 17 people were injured, and as things happened, it fell into the political court. And The Massachusetts legislature called for a uh, investigation. And at the same time, the uh, company, the Western Railroad, appointed a committee and put in, in charge that committee, Major George Whistler. And as it turns out, Whistler chose a system based on the military system and was the first person to introduce what we now call the organization chart where things are broken up into functions, and it's very hierarchical, and each function has its own 
people that report to them and uh, we've all seen these it's the companies who work and probably have them uh, but this is where they came from they didn't exist until 1841 but you'll notice one funny thing that this does look an awful lot like a diagram of a train wreck and so the nickname that this style of management came from that was based on militaristic and command and control was train wreck management creating central offices run by people called managers which was a new term distinct functional divisions a chain of command clear lines of authority etc was also the ability to place blame when something happened something went wrong it was the conductor's fault it was the driver's fault etc and that style of management train wreck management lasted from 1841 until in many businesses until the present day and then in the beginning of the 20th century someone came along who really revolutionized the way we approached work he was a product of his time and was a believer in social Darwinism which meant he believed that the owner class were somehow evolutionarily superior to the people that worked for them the the ordinary people that worked for them and this casts some of the things that he wrote in a light that has made him unpopular in certain circles. But that, that aside, you can't talk of the improvements that have taken place and how we do things. And actually, improvement in the quality of life for the people who work in factories, in manufacturing, without starting with Frederick Winslow Taylor and his book, which was called Scientific Management. And that became the first of two arms of what we call classical management theory. And those two arms are called the scientific and the other is the administrative. And the scientific which tended to be more empirical, more, more involved to actually working right on the work floor, was uh, concerned with individual productivity. And increasing the productivity of the workers, and, and part driven in Taylor's time by the fact that there just weren't enough workers to go around for all the factories that were opening up. The administrative was concerned with the overall organization itself, and, and these two together made up what we call classical management theory. And you can see that their roots, of course, only go back to 1900. And then the next big step, the work of Henri Fayol. Uh, Fayol was the first real administrative management theorist, and many of the principles that he laid down we'll be looking at later. And then Mary Parker Follett did the work that created human resource management. How do we take into account that human beings aren't like machines? And Elton Mayo, who is a, a scientist also, um, worked with Western Electric in what's now famous called the Hawthorne Studies, gave birth to a, a new term in the management dictionary, and that was the Hawthorne effect. One of the outcomes that they found from this was that going to the work floor and engaging in dialogue with the workers gave them a sense of dignity that was more important to them than any financial incentive. And then we saw the beginning of what was the precursor to flow production instead of looking at breaking things down into parts, looking at the overall flow of raw materials through the factory and, and developing tools to work that way and that began really the first uh, phrasing of it was begun by a man named Frank Woolard in 1923 some 32 years before Taiichi Anna would finalize the creation of the Toyota production system. In 1924 again working at Western Electric which had become a I guess a hotbed of the improvement of management scientifically we saw the creation of Walter Schuhart's control chart. And then we saw the birth of what we call modern cost accounting with official government and international bodies being set up and deciding that this is the way books would be kept. But at this point, the books were not being kept for operations. The books were being kept for investors.
And then we saw World War II and the what was what is called the American miracle. Uh, under the leadership of a number of, of key scientists and engineers, but in particular, uh, Dr. W. Edwards Deming, the United States Department of Defense set up the, the War Manpower Commission and to uh, train people working in factories to be able to produce quality goods for the war effort. They had to work with people who had not been acceptable to the Army um, and for the first time in a large scale, uh, housewives who entered the workplace to take the jobs that the men had held. And with this training, working with Dr. Deming and applying statistical process control in the control chart, they were able to turn this group of inexperienced workers in a very short period of time into one of the most powerful industries in the world. The men who had worked the factories originally and the owners of the factories and had this incredibly successful business structure in place, they didn't really realize what had made it successful and so they abandoned what had built that success and in the face of no competition uh, there was no nothing to shake them out of uh, their belief. Japan, one of the conquered nations which would radically change the face of business in the next decade, decade and a half, and that was that General MacArthur, who had been in charge of the rebuilding of the Japan, needed radios to communicate his information to the different people spread out over Japan, which was in total ruins. And he couldn't get reliable radios made. MacArthur brought in a number of different people, including a man named Homer Saracen, to bring what had been developed in training within industry and abandoned in the United States with the return of the men from the wars to Japan to help build a new managerial class in Japan. And then the Japanese Engineering Association heard that Dr. Deming was in Japan and they heard what he'd done for American business and they asked him to come and give a series of talks, which he started in 1950 and over the next decade he talked to them uh, a number of times. And they credit, the Japanese credit that with igniting what has become known as the Japanese miracle, which was the incredible growth of the Japanese economy from total destruction starting in about 19, the late 1940s to uh, by 1960 it being the second largest economy in the world with a land space that was a fraction of what the United States had and a population a fraction of the United States. And they attribute the beginning of that miracle to the American Dr. Deming. The high point of this change was the uh, the creation of and then the implementation of the Toyota production system in 1955 that was devised with the, by the Toyota family and a couple of people and led by a man named Taichi Ono, who we will also talk about later. And their system, unlike train wreck management, which was, was based on finding people to blame in the case of disasters, their system was based on not hiding them in blame, but bringing problems to the surface where they can be dealt with and on teamwork and on focusing on quality. In the 1960s and 70s, we saw the advent of the, the Japanese cars entering into the um, U.S. market. And in fact, I saw myself in an interview with Henry Ford Jr. at the time saying, yes, we make lousy cars and we'll continue to make lousy cars as long as people buy them. But in 1980, Lloyd Dobbins of NBC released a documentary called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? to answer the, the decline, the crisis that the United States had, had entered. And, and uh, the last 20 minutes of that was an interview at now 79 years old of Dr. Deming talking about what he did in Japan and what needed to change in the United States. And that led to Dr. Deming being a very busy man the last 12 years of his life. And since that time, we've entered the era of, you know, about 1992 with the death of Dr. Deming. We've seen the, the, the rise of the management fads and celebrities. But to put things in perspective, the invention of the fax machine took place around the same time as the invention of the job of manager. And the invention of the television took place before the adoption of modern cost accounting. The point being that these things are very, very new. So there's still an opportunity for people like you and me, if we work hard and we study hard and learn, to make a real contribution to this young and evolving art and science 